So, so thanks everyone, um, and it's it's a great pleasure to introduce Jim English. Uh, Jim is John Welsh Centennial Professor of English Literature at the University of Pennsylvania, where he directs the Penn Humanities Forum, and is also the founding director of the Price Lab for Digital Humanities. And Jim's research covers the sociology and economics of culture, the history of English studies as an academic discipline, and British fiction, film, and television since the 1930s. His most recent books are The Economy of Prestige, Prizes, Awards, and the Circulation of Cultural Value, published in 2005, and in 2012, The Global Future of English Studies. In 2010, Jim co-edited with Rita Felsky a special issue of New Literary History titled New Sociologies of Literature, and in his own work, he's pioneered what he calls, quote, a sociology of literary production, where production is understood to mean not merely or even primarily the production of certain kinds of texts by authors, but the production of certain kinds of value by a social system whose agents include readers, reviewers, editors and booksellers, professors and teachers, and all the many moving pieces of literature's institutional apparatus. Well, to my mind, mapping those many moving pieces is essential to understanding the various ways in which books are made today. And that's precisely what Books in the Making has been all about. So there's no better person to bring the day to a close. Um, please join me in welcoming Jim. Thank you, David, for uh, Thank you both for inviting me. I appreciate it. And it's a little daunting, actually, to have to go last and longest after a day of such stimulating and articulate presentations from people who really know a lot about the publishing business. Is this mine, by the way? Uh, I better. Be. <laughs> Is it? It's fresh. OK. Um, uh, as I'm, I'm a total outsider, of course to the business. Um, anyway, but I'll, I'll give it a try. I should do my trigger warning. Um, there's some mathematics in this talk. <laughs> Not very much. There's some data as well. All right, so um, be afraid, be very afraid. Um, I, I wanted to use this concept of the Great Divide as a way to just sort of get talking and to organize what's um, uh, uh, Really, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to offer sort of a series of, um, of sketches of some, some new work, not, not uh, all of it my own by any means. Um, and the Great Divide is a concept that has been around uh, even longer than, uh, than, than Andreas uh, Huysens' book, which is now 30 years ago, after the Great Divide. Um, he's already talking about uh, an after, um, the Great Divide being understood by him and, and others as this, this binary um, kind of uh, drawing apart of high and low culture, of more experimental, adventurous, um, and prestigious or respectable um, forms of culture, serious literary culture, you could say, in the terms we've been using today, um, versus um, merely entertainment or mass culture of mass literature. So that great divide, Huysen was, was arguing that it had um, narrowed or even sort of reversed or at least gotten a lot more complicated um, with the postmodern turn. And so it's, he's making a, 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 an argument for a double relationship, both a double binary, you could say, both the great divide and uh, modernist versus postmodernist moments historically. So the Great Divide is sort of no longer, no longer with us, or at least not in the same way. Um, since that was published, people have gotten very impatient with that idea <laughs> and with these sweeping narratives of high and low. And um, it's like that represents an earlier and simpler moment in our understanding of literary reception. Um, but as I think we've, uh, we've, we've uh, seen today with the way that we've all been discussing um, this scene and, and system of, of literary uh, production, 
and reception, uh, we can't actually do away with this notion of a divide, with this binary, this fundamental, what I think of as a two-axis model of, of the literary field is still extremely useful and, um, in, in fact, necessary, I would say, for a lot of the, uh, a lot of the kinds of work that, that, that we all do. Um, and as David was saying, you know, my understanding of, of the literary field is of this dynamic relational system with a lot of players in it working from more and less advantaged positions um, and competing for certain stakes, um, which are rare, you know, and worthy of attainment. And those stakes are, I think still, they're, they're various kinds, but still the two most important are economic stakes, money, you know, the profit motive on the one hand, and the symbolic or reputational stakes of prestige or status on the other. Um, so you have people for whom what they really are, are hoping for, their ambitions, you could say, or at least the, um, the, 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 the implicit goals of the game they're playing and the way they're playing it is not money, but the respect of other serious authors, um, a place on the syllabi of university courses in future years, these kinds of stakes. So those are the symbolic or reputational stakes separate from money. Um, anyway, so that if we could agree that that's a simplified but still very useful scheme, um, I, I want to talk about some work in which it's been operationalized recently um, in intriguing attempts to grasp the, the social logic of literary prestige via um, text mining or textual analytics um, using um, machine learning algorithms or natural language processing software from linguistics um, to, uh, uh, to, to, to um, read fairly large uh, corpora of digitized literary uh, work. And also in some less Algori less algorithmically ambitious, but still statistically driven work that I've been uh, I've been doing myself on uh, on the field of contemporary fiction, and I think that the, that this work um, uh, possibly has some things to tell us about the great divide as it obtains today, um, and uh, and about how we might proceed to do further uh, further work to study that that division. The first project I want to describe is um, something that Ted Underwood and Jordan Sellers at the University of Illinois have done uh, called the Long Durée of Literary Prestige. This is forthcoming, um, as is the work that, uh, that, that I'll be presenting of my own, as is also a, a, a lovely piece by uh, Gunter Leipold here, um, in a, a forthcoming issue of Modern Language Quarterly, MLQ, which will be out in just a, just, just a few months. Um, so this long durée piece, um, uh, it's, it's a really nice illustration of how what Underwood calls contrastive sampling across two fraction, fractions of a textual corpus can reveal hidden laws governing the distribution of social prestige. He's working with a large body of digitized uh, British and American poetry volumes. Uh, there are, I think it's around 50,000 volumes of digitized um, uh, poetry. This is between the years of 1820 and 1920, so out of copyright is the key. Um, uh, so they, they have this large set to work with. Um, out of that, they've carved a sample of prestigious or high status volumes and a prestigious and a, and a sample of everything else it doesn't have any particular prestige or standing, what they call a random sample drawn from the rest of the field or everything else. Um, now, machine learning, the kind that they're doing, machine learning um, is, is it's a process whereby, and believe me, I'm not the best person to explain uh, machine learning. I'm not a, com a computer scientist um, at all. But um, if you don't know anything about how this sort of artificial intelligence um, works. Machine learning is you take a piece of software um, and you need to have a bunch of data in two pieces. And it's going to perform 
statistical comparisons between the two bodies of data, and it's going to look for patterns. All right. So, for example, meteorologically, right? If you're going to um, predict the weather, I know the algorithms don't work so well in this country, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, but they work extremely well compared to what meteorologists used to be able to do in the um, pre-machine learning age. Um, and and what, what you would do meteorologically is you take, for example, um, all the meteorological data available for a particular day, and then all the corresponding meteorological data available for, let's say, 10 days prior. All right? And you, those would be your two sets. And you would point your algorithm at those two sets and say, do you see any pattern here? Then you'd give it another day, another 10 days before, another day, another 10 days. You have this all in like a massive database. And it's looking for these patterns. And then you can give it a new piece of data that it's never seen before, right? You hold out some of these dates and you give it a new one and you, and you give it, or sorry, you don't give it, you give it the 10 days prior and you say, what do you think it's going to be the next day? And it predicts. Machine learning algorithms are predictive machines. They make predictions. All right. So in this case, um, Underwood and Sellers, they take the prestige set, they take the, um, the everything else uh, set, and they, uh, they have 360 volumes of each. They show the algorithm all but one volume, divided into these two, these two pieces, and they say, look for patterns between the two. And they show it the one it hasn't seen and go, which do you think it is? Right? And it predicts. Um, and they do that then for every single one. So they actually have 600 and whatever it is, 30 different models, but they're almost exactly the same. It's just that you can't show it the thing that is going to be predicted, right? So you have to hold one out again and again. So this is how they did it. And, um, and they end up with a pretty impressive result. Ignore the, uh, ignore the line. I can't, I, that, it would take too long to explain what that is. That's showing some interesting thing about the model. But what you want to look at here, so these are the triangles are the reviewed or prestigious texts, and the round ones are randomly selected from everything else. All right? And the, um, so the machine, in each case, it's saying, I predict that this, because it's above 50%, it's saying, this is, what are the odds that this came from the reviewed set? Saying, um, the odds are good, this came from the reviewed set, the odds are very good, the odds are this, according to this predictive machine. Overall, you would expect that it would get, you'd be right half the time anyway, if it's just guessing. But this, um, this algorithm is actually correct 80% of the time. So 80% of the time, you could give it an unknown volume of poetry from anywhere in between 1820 and 1920 and say, do you think this volume was reviewed in one of the major journals during that time, or one or more of the major journals? And 80% of the time, it will tell you correctly whether it was or wasn't. So Underwood and Sellers draw two conclusions from this. Um, they, uh, they, first of all, they say that despite what we know to be, certainly think to be, but I think we, we do know to be, very important shifts, even sort of revolutions, in poetic standards that occurred over the course of that 100 years, as you go from Victorian, well, from Romantic verse to Victorian verse, and the, sort of, the repudiation of Victorian poetics, the revolution of the word and modernism, so on, these important sort of period breaks that we're all accustomed to in, in literary history, um, that there is some fundamental distinction that is guiding the choices as to whether something is worthy of critical attention or not that's the same for a whole hundred years. The algorithm is doing the same thing for that entire 100 year span. And it's not, it does not have to change up and do some different kind of a calculation, or look for some different kind of verse at a later point in the century versus an earlier. It's constant. It also, the algorithm, you know, we should bear in mind, it doesn't know, it doesn't know anything about poetry. It doesn't know it's looking at poetry. It doesn't know anything, it's not looking at rhymes. It's not, doesn't know, does not do prosody in any way. It's the, all the data that, that, that this algorithm is looking at is individual words. It's just comparing vocabularies. 
So then uh, Underwood and, and Sellers go inside the black box a little bit. They, they look, first of all, to try to figure out which uh, words, which particular words, um, is the model relying on most heavily to make its predictions, right? So which ones does it seem to be associating most strongly with the prestige set or with the, the non-prestige set? So they look at those individual words, see what, what can we tell from this, if anything. The other thing they did is they looked at, you see how some of these predictions are very, very confident. So they looked at um, some actual sort of examples, like, all right, you know, uh, Keats's uh, Eve of St. Agnes or Lamia um, or Tennyson. Well, what is it about these that it were, seems so easy for the model um, to predict versus these which seem so easy for it to predict in the other direction? They, so by doing this, they tried to get inside because the algorithm is making such complex calculations statistically that you don't really know what it's doing. Um, but they tried to guess. And, and what they came up with by looking at this stuff was they said, mainly it's just a leaning toward concrete words, um, a lack of sentimentality in the vocabulary, and a kind of darkness or gloominess of vocabulary. That's mainly what the algorithm <laughs> seems to be spotting in the prestigious, the ones that are reviewed. Right? So, um, so knowing really nothing about poetry, looking only at the words and not at any of the many things that we consider to be very important in separating good poetry from bad, um, it nonetheless um, says over this 100-year span, there's just this one constant law of social division. Cheery and inspirational abstractions uh, will be shunned by the gatekeepers, <laughs> you know, <laughs> literary prestige. Uh, OK, so now there's obviously there's a lot more to say about, about this, uh, this model. Um, uh, but I, I want to jump forward to the contemporary um, and, uh, and, 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 and look at what this kind of contrastive sampling might might reveal to us with respect to our own, our own literary field. With the assistance of Eva Portalance, uh, Andrew Piper, a book historian um, and founder of a new journal that is, hasn't appeared yet, but uh, is coming out, I think, this uh, May, called Cultural Analytics. Uh, Andrew is at Montreal. And he, um, he and his um, associate, uh, Eva Portalance, they gathered uh, comparative samples from a data set of digitized novels all published within the last like 10 or 12 years, all 21st century novels. Um, and they've done various things uh, with, uh, with these, but um, they have a, uh, a prestigious sample as part of this set of novels, which um, like Piper, they're using the review, this comes back to something that uh, Stefan was asking about, we were discussing just, uh, just, just prior, uh, reviewed novels as a proxy for more prestigious um, or, you know, sort of high status uh, novels. Um, and by the way, neither uh, Underwood nor Piper makes a distinction between positive reviews and negative reviews. It does, statistically, that doesn't matter. It, just being reviewed um, seems to be all you need for, for this kind of, you know, algorithmic uh, uh, analysis. Um, but Piper also has another set, which is um, prize, prize winners, he calls it, but it's, it's actually shortlisted or win uh, a prize. So he's got, I think it's uh, 200 in each category, roughly, 216 here, prize, 200 bestsellers is another one. Um, and then the New York Times reviewed are the ones that uh, he uses for that other sort of status set. Um, and then various various genre fictions. Right. So he's working with, with, uh, with six sets. And they're using a, a natural language processing software that, um, in this case, it links certain word frequencies um, to uh, vocabularies or dictionaries around a particular topic or disposition that are baked in to the software. So it's not just looking for any and all patterns. It's, it's working with these categories, like nature or technology or childhood, um, words that are angry or swear words. These are defined, defined categories. Um, and it uses the, relevant, uh, the, the relative prominence 
uh, of those vocabularies to, to find similarities or differences between these different, these different data sets. Um, based on the patterns of more and less distinctive words in these samples, he, uh, Piper attempts to describe the main difference between uh, more and less prestigious works of fiction. In prize-winning novels, the words that stand out as significantly more frequent are associated uh, with three themes, nature, childhood, and time. All right. Those seem to be the, the, the most important. Time also appears um, in this category. This is the, one, the words that are most important in marking bestsellers. Uh, but notice that the time here, this is a particular kind of time words that are time words pointing to the past. Um, and these are time words pointing to the present and the future, immediately, <coughs> momentarily, minute, right? Hour, quick, today. Whereas here we have born, old, uh, winter, youth, so on. All right. So, um, so he's looking. Uh, he's he's looking at these um, distinctions, and um, <clears throat> he observes that. And here he's got a, a nice graphic. He observes that, quote, as we move up the cultural scale from popular genres like romance and mystery to mainstream bestsellers, to works reviewed in respected journals, to novels selected for major awards, we see an increase of nostalgic narrativity with prize winners representing something like a high cultural apex. At this upper register of literary status, a high proportion of work seems to cohere around the language and tropes of nostalgia and retrospection. Now, this conclusion, um, which I'll say a little bit more about later on, but this conclusion intersects with uh, my own work on the field of contemporary fiction, which um, several of you here have, have already uh, heard me talk about. Um, and this work concerns the temporal settings of, of contemporary novels. Um, it's been conjectured, notably by Perry Anderson, um, writing in LRB a few years back, that in what Anderson calls the upper ranges of fiction, recent decades have witnessed one of the most astonishing transformations in literary history, namely the abrupt and unexpected resurrection of the historical novel. Uh, it had seemed to be playing, it had seemed to be dead um, for much of the 20th century, but turned out to be just playing possum and has lately become, he says, more widespread even than it was at the height of its classical period in the 19th century. Um, now, parallel with this notion that contemporary fiction has turned toward the past is the view, it's anecdotally supported by what I'm seeing a rise of um, cli fi syllabi. In, uh, in universities, the you know uh, climate change uh, dystopias, um, and uh, fr frequently uh, has has been uh, the point's been been made again, sort of anecdotally, um, by reviewers um, that, uh, and systematically by Frederick Jameson among others, uh, that in fact the contemporary field has seen a kind of uh, leeching across of of modes or forms. Um, from science fiction into serious literary fiction, um, and that there's been a kind of turn toward the future in, uh, in contemporary uh, literary studies. So there's that conjecture as well. And my work is an attempt to put this double conjecture of a flight from the present in contemporary um, fiction, Anglophone fiction, I should say, um, to an empirical test, gauging the degree to which it's valid and finding the moment um, if it is valid, when such a trend or trends begin. Piper and Portalance's study of nostalgic narrativity seems to speak to this matter, uh, um, and it does, but there are, there are difficulties. For one thing, the novels in their corpus are all drawn from the 21st century, right? Um, so it's, it's just a, it gives us a snapshot of now. What I'm looking for is a span of 50 or 60 years to see if, in fact, things have changed in some way, uh, if, there's been, uh, if there's been a shift. And so I need to, I need to gather my novels, my data set, um, 
in some repeatable, consistent way, year by year, over a span. I started in 1960. All right. And, um, and I am looking, I'm sort of hoping for, and I do, I think, find um, something like a break point or a pivot point. Um, uh, Underwood and, and, uh, and, and Sellers, their, their work is part of a larger kind of project of Underwood's uh, to contest the idea of periodization and show that um, there's long span um, phenomena that more accurately tell us about literary history and that we're sort of obsessed with short span literary histories. But I think there are actually breaks and things do change at certain moments and I'm looking for one. The moment when we could say, here's where contemporary fiction, when the, where the field of literary production comes to look something like it does today. And before that it was different. So this is where we should start talking about it. That's sort of what I'm looking for. Um, like Piper, I use prizes as my proxy for literary prestige. Um, but, uh, but my data set is seven times larger than his because I, I, I go back you know, much farther. He's got 200, I've got uh, 15 or 1,500 novels that were shortlisted for prizes. Um, 1960 to the present. Um, that takes care of the high cultural apex, as Piper calls it. But what of the rest of the field? You will have noticed that in Piper and Portalance's work, there's no rest of the field. There's no set that represents like a random selection of everything else, as, as Underwood um, calls it. Um, that, that is indeed a stumbling block for people who are working in contemporary fiction. Um, there are two problems, um, both pretty obvious, but um, not obvious how to solve them. The first is copyright. Uh, you can't easily gather large corpora of digitized in copyright books and share them and work on them the way that everyone does in the 18th and 19th century. That's why so much of the digital work has been focused on pre-copyright. Um, the, um, the, uh, the other problem, because there are, I mean, at this point, there are data sets of in copyright fiction um, that is digitized novels that are like three to four thousand novels big at the Chicago Text Lab and the Stanford um, Literary Lab. Um, and that's not small. And in fact, you could do things with that. And the, um, uh, the, the novel set that Franco Moretti at Stanford um, used uh, and his many colleagues there um, used, um, you know, to very good effect in some of their experiments was about the same. Um, but that was the 19th century. And so the other problem has come up uh, here is that the scale of publishing has grown so enormously. And uh, over that whole span of, of 100 odd years, but especially lately, the contemporary period is this period of just massive, massive um, expansion with, um, you know, by conservative estimates, um, since, say, 1990, there have been more than a million new novels published. Um, and the, the numbers are very hard to get at. A lot of the novels that are published are not even counted or even really countable. Um, the industry is paying attention to print books, but their statistics mostly don't get us inside of the, uh, uh, the Kindle books, the e-book numbers. Um, so we have that difficulty. There's a lot of books are being published now without ISBNs. All of these were something like 20% of new fiction is being published somewhere in that general ballpark, very soft figures these, um, without ISBNs. That's, that's the category that's growing rapidly, sort of uncountable. I tried to get inside just to get a, some feel for what's going on in terms of new works of fiction by looking at the raw data dumps that Amazon um, uh, provides quarterly. And uh, last year, um, they, they dumped uh, 200,000. It's just a database of like the 200,000 best-selling e-books. And they're categorized. They give you some, some information about them. So I pulled out anything in that that is a novel that has a, uh, a publication date within a year of the, the data dump. Um, 
just to get a sense of how much of this is new, uh, uh, that's a publication date, so uh, how much of this is new fiction of one kind or another. Um, adult, sorry, just adult, adult fiction looking at that as well. Um, and it was 20,000 of the 200,000, right? Now this is the best sellers of the e-books, right? Amazon has a few million e-books out there, and this is just the top 200,000. So, you know, you multiply that, and I don't know. It's 150,000 new novels a year, 180. Matt Wilkins says it's higher than that. I, I don't know. But, um, but so this is, a, this is a problem, that we, um, we're dealing with a scale that's too large, with kinds of novels that we don't really um, uh, even understand very well. And so when we start talking about everything else, and a sample of everything else, and doing it, that kind of an experiment, we really um, we, we, we don't know what we're talking about. It's a, it's a meaningless scenario. But the runaway scale of publishing, uh, it, it only represents an insurmountable problem for sampling. Um, if what we're trying to sample is the set of every single work of any kind that some author has made in an effort to make a novel and that's found its way into some kind of publication form. That's, that's work that amounts to uh, a kind of history of authorship. Um, a lot of sampling of everything else basically works that way in, in digital humanities and text mining. Everything else is understood to be a kind of unweighted set of all the books that are out there that are digitized. Um, that's not what we need here. You know, I don't think. If we're looking for the Great Divide, we've got, on the one hand, uh, a set that represents books that were seized upon um, with positive attention by critics. So we're granted a kind of special status or respectability, on the one hand. And the books we want, on the other hand, is a sample of books that um, were not seized upon by critics or experts, but rather by ordinary readers, right? Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, it, it, it should be a matter of, um, of tokens rather than, rather than types, the actual individual books that are in circulation um, rather than the titles uh, or ISBN numbers as the, uh, as the, as the complete set. So um, using that as a relative, uh, that, that as the relevant unit of analysis, uh, recent developments in publishing have actually made our task much easier because the tremendous concentration that we've been hearing about today of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, sales on just a few blockbuster bestsellers, the top of the list, um, that means that these days just the top 10 bestsellers account for more sales volume as much as 20 or even 25% of total sales volume than all the tens of thousands of titles in that long tail uh, of fiction, many of which are selling like five copies or 15 copies. I heard the average ebook sells under 50 copies. You know, so, um, so if, you're, if you're looking for um, a, uh, a reasonable proxy for the kind of fiction that's being bought and read, um, but aside from very, very rare instances of overlap, is excluded from the tranche of higher prestigious work, you really can just use um, top 10 or top 20 bestsellers, and you don't have to dig any further than that. So we could regard Piper's bestsellers, to go back to his uh, slide for a second, we can regard his bestsellers here um, as, a, uh, as a good proxy for the other side of the Great Divide. Um, it's the, that idea of um, a, a, a great divide, it was never like you're looking for the lowest of the low, the most disreputable and disgraceful works out there. It's, um, it's rather the kind of mass appeal, the work that has, has broad, broad appeal. So it's not that surprising that uh, the bestsellers appear here um, as a kind of middling category in this algorithmic reading. Um, so my project uh, of contrastive sampling then compares shortlisted novels on the one hand, 
or, or winners, to top 10 bestsellers. The key feature being compared is temporal setting. So we're tagging novels depending on whether they were published within 20 years of their publication, to, uh, sorry, depending on whether their setting, their principal uh, setting of, of action is within 20 years of the publication date, uh, more than 20 years prior to the publication date, or at some point in the near or distant future. Uh, there are novels that are set in more than one of these temporal spaces, and those we just count as half and half, or one third, one third, one third, if it's like um, David Mitchell's Cloud Atlas, or Jennifer Egan's Waiting for the Goon Squad, or something, you just put them in as fractions and calculate them in statistically that way. When I said that my work, though statistically driven, um, is, uh, is, is algorithmically unambitious, that's because no one has figured out how algorithmically to identify novels with earlier or more contemporary temporal settings. Even the, the genre of historical novel, uh, genres are something that machines are very good at spotting and separating out from other genres, but historical novels don't seem to operate like other genres. They overlap with a lot, and um, it's, uh, it's, it seems to be difficult. And temporal setting, what I'm looking at, is actually a different thing than historical novels, which can be defined in a lot of ways, and you could have arguments over it. Temporal setting is a little bit more straightforward. So um, we are just starting a project now at this Price Lab at, at, at my university. Um, that's going to try to figure out a way to do this algorithmically and see if we can, if we, if we can uh, uh, in, that, in that case, be able to work with much larger sets of data. But for now, we're just doing it by hand, just uh, identifying these things by the old-fashioned way, by looking at the books and reviews and so on and tagging. Now, the, uh, the result, which just is spit out of Excel as pivot tables and, and bar charts, Oh, sorry, this is a couple of slides. When I was talking about the scale of publishing, you know, in the 19th century, uh, you, the, the guys who are working digitally with this many novels digitized, well, there's only that many that are still extant. There were others published, but you could never get your hands on them, so that's a fantasy corpus there. Well, now you've got that same 3,000 is now here in Chicago. <laughs> and, uh, and here's a bigger one that we can't use anymore because Apple owns it. Um, and you've got like, you know, something like this published. So we're dealing with a very difficult situation when you start saying, well, let's sample everything. And you think that if we just can take a random sample of this, we're getting a sample of everything. I just don't think it works that way. Too many filters and biases of all sorts involved there. Anyway, um, here's the slide I was heading for. Uh, so if you look at the, uh, the outputs then on this, um, this simple statistical calculation, back in the 60s, if you picked up a new work of fiction, either because it was a critic's darling um, and uh, you know, a finalist for the National Book Award, um, or, uh, or uh, that would be this one, or because it was a bestseller, everybody's reading it on the beach where you're vacationing. Um, either way, and we can look at them uh, together on one chart here with the uh, the, the prize novels at the top. Either way, back in the 60s, um, it's about 75% likely that the book you're reading is set principally within 20 years of your own present day. Um, contemporary fiction, in this very crude sense, was about contemporary times um, at, that, at, at that stage. And in the 70s, things change a bit. Um, in that uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a, a dip away from contemporaneity. This, again, down here is bestsellers. Um, they both drop down by 10% or so. Um, but uh, the, that, that trend does not hold in, uh, in, in the bestsellers. They go right back up, starting the end of the 70s and the 80s. They stop going down, and then they rise up. And then you've got um, roughly 80%, even higher proportion, of best-selling novels 
are set in the present than even back in the 60s. So they become more contemporary. Whereas if we look at the, uh, the prestigious novels, the shortlisted novels, they just continue going down and they drop sharply at the end of the 70s and into the 80s. Um, they keep going down and they've been a minority taste um, for some decades now. Um, Perhaps surprisingly, at least for, uh, for devoted readers of Frederick Jameson, uh, novels set in the future play only a small role in this, this striking post-70s rearrangement. Uh, yet that role has something important to tell us. You can see that you know, basically novels set in the future are almost, almost invisible uh, in these, especially you know, here. Um, uh, but but this the the relative unimportance here of uh, novels set in the future does tell us something about um, how temporality and status and genre work. Um, the orientation of bestsellers has become so overwhelmingly contemporary that neither the past nor the future settings command more than a small share of them. But uh, within that fraction, futuristic settings um, have grown and have actually sort of helped contemporary settings in drawing historical settings down into the single digits. Very low here, um, the last 15 years. Um, among shortlisted works, novels set in the future have shown no such tendency to increase. Instead, um, hovering around the low level of the 60s, basically just a few, a few percent. And significantly, not one of the 18 shortlisted novels that are set in the future was ever shortlisted for either of the leading science fiction prizes. So there are a few there, but they're not ones that were ever shortlisted for the, the leading sci-fi um, prizes being the Hugo and the Nebula. Their special distinction lies precisely in being judged to depict an imagined future without assimilating themselves to science fiction as such. Um, the rarity of this feat attests to the strength of the futuristic setting as a genre marker for science fiction and to the enduring antagonism between genre fiction and the literary. If it's set in the future, then it belongs to genre fiction, sci-fi. If it belongs to genre fiction, we can't put it on the short list for the Booker Prize. That's basically the, um, what I think is being suggested. Jameson recently observed for all the philosophical power and formal vitality of sci-fi, it remains stigmatized as a genre and thus lacks the necessary quotient of Bourdieu distinction, he says, to warrant recognition as literary or experimental, terms that mean, in essence, non-generic. Um, and, you know, indeed, if we look at that uh, map of Pipers and Portalances again, they're different segments. Only romance is as far from prestige on their map as, uh, as, as sci-fi is. A historical setting, whether 30 years in the past or 300 years in the past, it doesn't appear to function as a genre marker in anything like this way. Um, there are, of course, many, many prizes for genre fiction. They have their own prizes, right? The Edgars uh, for mystery novels, the Dagger Awards for crime fiction, the Ritas for romance, all of that. Um, we find novels set in the past scattered across the short lists of all of these prizes. Um, they're more sparsely than on the short list for the Booker, you know, the Booker Prize or the Pulitzer, but still they're, they're there and they're not uncommon. But there are no genre prizes for historical fiction itself. Uh, or, or rather, um, actually there were none until very recently. Um, founded in 2010, uh, Britain's, what else, Walter Scott Prize uh, is the exception. Um, whose immediate redundancy with non-genre prizes proves the rule. Its first four recipients, Hilary Mantel, Andrea Levy, uh, Tan Tuan Eng, and Sebastian Barry, were all past winners or shortlist veterans of the Man Booker, and the novels for which they won the Scott all received other loftier accolades in recognition of their extra generic excellence. So you, it doesn't help to have a generic prize in that category, historical novels. Um, anyway, I. I take my results here um, as, uh, as one more exhibit 
in the mounting pile of evidence that the statistical approach of contrastive sampling can help to refine generalizations arrived at by more traditional methods. Uh, these latter methods, so, for, so uh, called traditional you know, literary historical methods, um, are not to be underestimated. And I'm not disparaging what uh, a, a great uh, uh, scholar like uh, Anderson or Jameson can do. A scholar with the kind of finely tuned uh, feel for the game um, that, that uh, those guys possess has effectively internalized um, complex and changing systems of relation on the field of literature. There's a lot of data um, that they've absorbed um, and internalized, and they can arrive at empirically sound readings of, of the field. Uh, in this case, yes, historical narratives have made an astonishing comeback within the upper ranges of fiction. That's certainly um, uh, the case. While science fiction, however much it may be contributing to the technique of formerly ambitious contemporary fiction writing, it mostly remains outside the compass of consecration. Um, but these observations can radically misconstrue, uh, they can radically misconstrue the, the portions of the field that are less visible to the academic vantage. As when Jameson, uh, summarizing Anderson, he asserts that, quote, the historical novel has never been so popular nor so abundantly produced as at the present time. A, a statement that is directly contradicted by the data on the last 50 years of bestsellers. It would actually, it would be more accurate to say the historical novel has never been so unpopular, right? Or so rarely produced as at the present time. It's only apparent if you're only looking at that prestige set, which for most of us, most of the time in literary academia is all we ever really look, look at. Um, and even where, as, as a scholar doing the kinds of things that we've been trained to do, um, even where we do end up with a fairly accurate perspective, it can leave a lot of the best action out of view. There's nothing especially astonishing, really, about the return to critical respectability of a previously dormant or depreciated genre. What we see in these data are signs of a more momentous and far-reaching shift, affecting the status of works bearing different relationships to the established categories of genre, and involving not just a sudden elevation of certain features of novels on the terrain of serious critical regard, but their equally sudden and virtually simultaneous repudiation on the wider field of fiction. Um, what's truly astonishing is this, this appearance of powerful but contrary tendencies taking hold sometime around the late 70s um, and early 80s, and, and in effect, opening up this uh, great divide that uh, was, uh, was being pronounced right at that moment um, to have closed or ceased to matter. Um, all right, it, uh, it remains to explain this, uh, and uh, I'm not going to do that. I, have, I do have, I do have some, some ways to do it, um, and, uh, and so we can talk about that in, in some, uh, uh, some, some Q&A, uh, if, if you like. But um, I will just say this, that in approaching that, that next step of how do you explain what you're seeing in the data, there's a tendency in, uh, the, in, in the profession, in literary studies, to reach for large scale explanations, to reach for um, some grand narrative of late capitalism or postmodernism the evisceration of the historical imagination by the neoliberal presentism, these sorts of <laughs> things. Um, and, and you can easily do that here. Uh, the, 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 the big explanations couldn't be more ready to hand. Um, and in fact, you don't even have to go further than Jameson's you know, great work on postmodernism. But I found that very unsatisfactory uh, doing that, because if the data were otherwise, if what we saw, in fact, were that um, in the prestige tier of literature, as well as in um, the ordinary or best-selling um, tier, in both of those sets, we saw a dwindling of historical and a rising of contemporary 
um, and to a lesser extent, future settings. Those grand explanations would explain that just as well, right? They'd say, well, it's the, it's the presentism of neoliberalism and everything. So um, it, it's, it's the trouble with big explanations is they explain too much. So what, where I've actually gone with this is to go back to that late 70s, early 80s moment and dive into the kinds of minutia of, um, of publishing, uh, the generational change that was occurring in London in the late 70s, the founding of Granta, LRB, these new people who came into play, the authors they favored, particular importance, I think, of Salman Rushdie um, at this time as a symbolic figure, also as a sort of speaker and networker, um, uh, and of his novel, Midnight's Children, um, looking also at New York, and what was happening with the conglomeration of, of media and the publishing houses there. There's an interesting sort of delay effect between this shift toward fiction set in the past and the prizes in Britain versus in the US. It's about a six year delay. US and it's just not happening, not happening, and then <laughs> happens all at once like, wait, we better keep up with the booker. You can chart that with other things that are going on in terms of like, how come we can't be like the booker? So anyway, those kinds of minutiae, that, that very um, small scale sort of sociological account um, of pretty big changes in the field of literary studies is looking to me more fruitful and more interesting um, than, uh, than, than, than its, uh, its, its counterpart. Um, and, and so I'll just end there with, with this, I guess, irony that the kind of work that I'm describing that other people are doing in a more advanced way that, than I am, but that raises the specter, the sort of evil specter of big data, um, that work can actually be a, a kind of a, a, a glide path into the meticulous, careful, small scale scholarly approach to literature that many of you have been, uh, have been presenting today. So that's all I'll tell you. And I'm happy to talk more in some Q&A. We, we do have some time.